Berkeley, 89.3 KPFC Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned for La Onda Bajita. We are the change makers, dropping conciencia and consejos like the U.S. government as soldiers. We don't just report the news, we make the news. Flipping the script on your mind as we are making changes in La Onda Bajita, dropping pearls on Pacific Radio. This is not just KPFA, this is Radio Liberación. We don't fake the funk, can't pull no punches, porque ya llegamos y no nos vamos. Mi gente, aquí estamos. Y en esta lucha, todo lo logramos. ¡Chicano! KPFA 94.1 FM and KPFB at 89.3 FM in Berkeley, Basultlas, with KFCF at 88.1 FM in Fresno, Califas. Orale, yo soy Gavilan Molina, cruising with La Onda Bajitas, Radio del Barrio Aslan. Eso. Tonight we're going to take back La Noche. Simón que yes. So open up your mentes to a truly unique experience in Radio Landia. We're a new vision. A new citizen and a new world where many worlds are possible. Aquí no más. So cruise with us as we take it from rock to revolution. To ritmo hasta la resistencia con la voz del pueblo del sol. FAM, we are La Onda Bajita's crew. We march, we protest, and we report. We are NPR Radio Comunitario. Orale. And we're coming at you live from the mothership here in Basur Class. Tonight, Friday the 11th, hombre? I think it's... No, uh, it's the 12th. Híjole, off one day. Just Friday... One, just one day. Just one day. Friday, the 12th of November, 2010. Countdown to 2012. La Onda presents a special feature lineup here. Híjole, I can feel it coming. Can you hear it? Yeah. That's right. Ahí viene. Ahí viene. The brown giant is awakened. Ay, vamos. Pasito al pasito. Orale. We got a special lineup here tonight uh, from 8 to 8.30. We got the Aslan Rising. And in the casa, we got Ernesto. That's right. And the crew here, we're going to be talking about cultura and the expression of arte as a political force. Eso. In the house tonight. Um, from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, we got Terra Alerta with uh, Tara and La Brava coming at you. And... Uh, we also, at 9 to 9.30, we got Radio Venceremos al Norte with uh, Julio Leva and uh, Artocayo Miguel Perez. And at uh, 9.30 to 10, we got Cruising with the Combs. That's right, Blast from the Past with uh, myself, uh, my compadre, Mr. Chuch, and Joss, bringing you some of those firme rolitas, you know, those ones, you know, take it song, kicking it, cruising, roll down the windows, prendete, ponle, eso, aquí nomás. So keep it right here nomás, we're going to take a little break, we're going to come right back, and we got our special guest in La Casa here. What are they, Mr. Chuch? Lo que está pasando en nuestro país, yo creo que la situación está grave, está muy grave, la verdad, porque ¿qué es lo que pasa? Más gente se está huyendo del país, más gente se está quedando sin trabajo, sin dinero, y cuando uno está en esa situación, ¿qué es lo que puedes hacer? Nada, cuando alguien tiene su, su espalda contra la pared, hacer lo que tienes que hacer, pero la cosa es que no podemos continuar así. Yo soy Gabriel Molina. We're back here. Gracias, Mr. Chuch, compadre. You know, it's the year 2020. Imagine your minds, eh? Close your eyes for a second. 
2020, órale. And for the past decade, the revolutionary Ganas Movimiento has achieved great strength and momentum. During these past 10 años, a working class Chicana, Chicano community in Southern Califas has been able to successfully control the economic, social, political, and educational aspects of their own community. Simón, the Movimiento has achieved this tremendous task through the education and empowerment of our youth, teaching them historical significance and beauty of the rich culture and infusing them with dignity and self-esteem through equal and balanced education. That's right. Education is a human right. Education is not a privilege. Orale. And we're here esta noche. Uh, we're going to be talking some about that, about the ganas, uh, times, and some of the arte here as we're looking at art as a cultural expression and a political force. And with us we have el compañero Ernesto. Bienvenido, Holmes. It's good to have you in the house. House. We've been talking here for the last kind of hour, kicking it here. Um, Ernesto is one of the persons responsible for the new upsurge of Chicano indígena art, you know, beginning to pop up throughout Aslan. Uh, I, caught, uh, I caught some of the first trabajo uh, when we were there with the crew uh, in Phoenix. Uh, some of that orange greens, you know, and some of the mensajes, you know, Alto, uh, Alto Arizona, etc. Pues, Ernesto, good to have you in the house, Holmes. Thank you, man. Thank you. And I know that you've been out, you know, kind of crisscrossing el estado. Uh, and, and this weekend, uh, you have a, a, a gallery opening, Ganas 2020. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the Ganas uh, Movimiento and the arte with it. So the Ganas Movement, it's about... Um it's about achieving the, sorry. So the Ganas movement to me, it's about achieving things that, that are almost working towards the odds at times. But Ganas means motivation and desire. And with motivation and desire, we can use it as a tool to, um, to really grasp and, and achieve anything we really want. And in this movement, that's exactly what the community does. They take a hold of their community and they take the reins of their community through ganas by first controlling the economic aspects of the community and from there they start controlling the the rest of the like education aspects and other aspects that they really could uh could build off of and um and it gets so strong to the point that um that they're able to really 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 control the economic portion of it so bad that the that the corporations no longer have a, a say in what's going on, and, and they're not getting they're, they're not getting supported within the community. It gets so the, the movement becomes so strong that they they're forced to move out. All the corporations are kicked out. Like there's no more um, big businesses, you know, no more mall culture in this in this uh, small town in, in Southern California. And it gets uh, it becomes a problem for these corporations. You know, it becomes it becomes they, they start seeing that they're losing capital and, and they were used to for so long seeing Raza be blind consumers you know and it's in the story it's no longer happening this way and that's when things take a turn in the story and uh, I mean this is kind of what we're talking throughout the and and within the story within the pieces at the at, at White Walls you'll see tomorrow about about uh, the resistencia of the people when when it gets to this point of of the corporations fighting back and backlashing, and then eventually the corporate CEOs and, and the corporate officials team up with uh, with with the government. You know, they they team up with the federal government in order to to keep fighting back. And first they try to slander the movement, then they try to they, they eventually create the the corporations and the government eventually create a prison within the in, in the story, and it's a prison just tailored for the people in the Ganas movement because at that point it's already a movement. So it's the Ganistas. They've started putting all the the Ganistas in the in the jail, and from there you have a, a uprising from the, from the rest of the people that are part of the movement. Increíble. That's the uh, voice of uh, Ernesto Yerena, the force behind the arte here, and uh, you know he's going to be having uh, his exhibit open up tomorrow at White Walls. That's in San Francisco. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. But right now, Ernesto, I mean, just hablando contigo, talking with you, uh, you know, you're on the cutting edge, you know, of, of uh, you know, arte that is capturing the moment. And right now, you know, this latest uh, imagen you gave me, you know, shows a, uh, it looks like, a, you know, a soldier, you know, a soldier of the military police. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard, it's very visual. 
Uh, and, and let me tell you, what, where do you get your material, hombre? Like, for instance, this image, you know, uh, the, and I've seen other images. When I was in Arizona, of course, everywhere, you know, tuvimos mirando, we kept seeing uh, uh, the whole, um, you know, uh, Alto Arizona, you know, la campaña contra SB, you know, 1070, SB 1070. El arte que, you know, the art that you come up with, you know, is in response you know, to uh, the pleitos, you know, the battles that the pueblo, the people are facing. Uh, how did you, you know, what made you decide, hey, you know, I got to capture this. Tengo que capturar. ¿Qué fue la decisión que te movió a hacer eso? I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly how, when was it, the exact time that I came up with it, but I think it, it, it all started when, when um, me and, and, and uh, my friend, Zach de la Rocha, we, we created a, a poster for to send money to to Tona, to Tona Tierra out there in uh, in Phoenix, and after that, after we had we had made that poster, we, they went for sale, and then we sent the money over there. He came up he came up with the idea to to expand the cam to, to create a campaign uh, titled the We Are Human campaign, and from there, um, uh, on May first, May sorry May second, two thousand nine, he took me and a couple of my friends out to Arizona, and. Um, from there, it's kind of it. All, it all just started from there, you know. We, I was out there, and I got to meet the people. I got to see the struggles firsthand, and uh, I ended up going back. And from there, I built a lot of friendships. And and um, anytime they need me out there, I'm always. If I can make it out, I, I will make it out. Yeah. Well, that's uh, you know, and, and making it out to Phoenix, Arizona. I think that's where we first. Uh, I remember seeing you, you know, and now we were talking a little bit a, a while ago, and you saw us there doing the live broadcast out of Tona Tierra. But, but let me ask you something, Ernesto. Um, uh, you know, you're also very uh, involved with Endilon, the National Day Laborers Organizing Network, and you've done some of the work. Yeah, I mean, the Alto Arizona project, they, they created it. That was it, start, it started with them. And uh, Pablo Alvarado and Chris Newman, they were, um, they kind of spearheaded it, and they had been telling me for months we got to do a poster about secure communities. Like secure communities is going to come, and it's going to start. It's it's going to create a lot of uh, ripple effect, and we got to stop it. And and I kept saying like I don't. I I started researching, and I couldn't come up with the right image, or, and or I started working on the show that I'm working on now. So I didn't I didn't get around to it. And all of a sudden in April one day, uh, Chris calls me. He's like, you know what, man? It looks like John Brewer is going to sign this thing called. It's like he said. It's like secure communities on crack. He said it's going to come in and be signed on uh, on Saturday. Get it done like right away. And this was like on a Tuesday, I believe. So he he and another uh, another friend from uh, Marco Loera from um, Endilon, they came down to my house and we just we just worked on it. And and, and that was the one with the with the thumbprint, Arizona with the th thumbprint on it. And uh, that was kind of inspired by by the actual federal government themselves. I went on the secure communities website. And they had a little, a bunch of little icons talking about, uh, like, the the way that they were going to build this massive database, you know. And they had like a little magnifying glass, and then and then one one of the other icons had a thumbprint, and it was talking about how they were going to create a, a massive like database of people who they might think uh, be undocumented, you know. And, and so that's when I was like, damn, like this is so crazy. They're trying to big make a big, uh, trying to basically create a big thumbprint. So I put Arizona in a thumbprint. I thought that would convey the message of this big like. Big Brother system, you know, they, they, they got going there. Orale, pues, uh, that's the voice of Ernesto Yerena. And we're going to be taking a little music break. Vamos a tomar una quebradita aquí de música y regresamos aquí con la plática con el compañero Ernesto Yerena, que está con nosotros esta noche, hablando de la fuerza del arte en uh, los movimientos políticos, particularmente, particularly the ones facing la raza. Orale, little music break, and we're going to be right back. <laughs> pena de la desgracia que ocurrió en la nación esta ley que han pasado en Arizona que legaliza la discriminación por falta del valor moral y fortaleza la migración se llegue a reformar ahora sufrirá la gente que trabaja y las familias separadas seguirán Arizona Estado de vergüenza, ¿qué has hecho con tu miedo y tu temor? En vez de ser familia. 
famoso por tu hermosura, tú tienes fama de racismo y rencor. seguir esta ignorancia destruirá la sociedad o continuamos espantados y callados o decidimos que por fin hay que gritar ya es tiempo de pararse con mucho orgullo por el valor que traemos a la nación con nuestras voces votos y nuestro dinero no permitamos ya la discriminación Arizona, estado de vergüenza, ¿qué has hecho con tu miedo y tu temor? En vez de ser famoso por tu hermosura, tú tienes fama de racismo y rencor. ¡Qué viva! That's right, uh, little Rolita here, and uh, yo soy Gavilán Molina, I'm here with my compadre Mr. Chuch at the controls, and in the casa... We got el compañero Ernesto, Ernesto Yerena, uh, who is one of the upcoming political art forces that's arising, like the Aguila Negra of Aslan. And as the Aguila Negra goes higher and higher to the sun, its shadow is cast over the landscape. Orale. Bienvenido, Ernesto. Good to have you in the casa. Um, you know, the art is out there, and uh, Ernesto is going to be having an exhibition here at the uh, White Walls Gallery in San Francisco. And uh, we're going to be giving you the information a little bit here on uh, where, it, um, where it's located. It's uh, running uh, November uh, 13th. That's a mañana from 7 to 11. And uh, it'll be showing through December, uh, the uh, I believe, the 20th. Uh, so it's going to be running a good month. Well, it's going to December 4th, I believe. Oh, December 4th? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, December 4th. It was made in a must-see if you want to see the radical... Uh, Chicano art that's surfacing from the movements against racism and uh, bigotry and hatred. Uh, this is the art. It answers that. It's a response. And uh, Ernesto, all I can say is that it's inspiring. I know myself and the crew here. Look, uh, our pelos están parados. We're getting goosebumps just talking about the art and even seeing the arte. Tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement uh, with this and, of course, uh, with Arte as a political force. Um, well, my involvement with with uh, the political force has been, it, it just, I haven't been around for it too long, and most of it has been in Arizona. And um, it's just different every time we go out there, you know, but it's it, something about Arizona and the way Tona Tierra and Navacalis run, it's very organic. You know, we go out there, and sometimes we, we make posters in L.A., we create them, and they get printed, and we go out there. But sometimes the budget don't don't allow for that, but it doesn't stop us. You know, we go over there, I cre we create some stencils, and we hand paint them in, in the parking lot of Tona Tierra, you know, and everyone comes out. You have uh, little kids all the way to, like, senor senoras helping cut stencils and spraying them, and, and it be it's always a way to, to engage the community into something new, you know, and... and um, and then the next day you get to see everyone carrying the the, the handmade signs at the protest and so that's always been um it's always been inspiring for me out there and i feel like as a, art and movements it, they kind of need each other for me I, as far as like speaking from an artist's perspective um i feel like i can't have one without the other it's almost you know i i go out there to 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 use my whatever i can do for for, for my people but then when I come back, I'm full of, I'm really inspired, and I and I'm able to work on my stuff, like the show Ganas 2020. You know, it's always a response. It's almost like having a conversation with, with yourself as an artist. But then you you, you do stuff when it's for art's sake, but saying something, and then you do stuff for the real world, or for the for the stuff that's going on right now. You know, uh, things like SB 1070, 287G, Joe Arpaio. You know, you you got a lot of these guys out there. And, uh, you know, this arte needs to get across the country because there's 17 other states considering the same type of legislation, you know, that happened in Arizona. And uh, so, Holmes, you know, you've got a lot of trabajo to do, but the arte is getting out there. Again, uh, we're talking to Ernesto Yerena, who will be uh, showing his uh, Ganas 2020. 
uh, his new work and uh, with an opening reception that is tomorrow, November the 13th from 7 to 11 p.m. And it's going to run through December the 4th. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a panel discussion tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be uh, myself, Jesus Barraza, and Melanie Cervantes. And they're, they're known as Dignidad Rebelde. And they're coming out of here from Oakland. Um, two of my favorite artists right there. They're really, really inspiring for me uh, themselves. Uh, them and uh, Fabiana, has ha they've had a large uh, inspiration to me when it comes to, to using more color and like making uh, images that are more uh, cultural and really bright stuff, you know, so they, I, I thank them for that, you know. Pues andale, Holmes. Pues mira, um, this latest image here, you know, the carta that you have here, I mean, it's a soldado, you know, it's obviously a soldier. Uh, could be a soldier in the Middle East. Could be a soldier on the, you know, uh, on the border. I mean, uh, in in doing your art, I've noticed, and you were talking about stencils. You use a lot of that, you know, stencils, uh, which makes it, I, I think, for people that don't have, you know, let's say training on how to use a brush, how to get colores y todo. It really facilitates people's involvement in art. Sometimes people, oh, I can't draw. You know, I never learned how to draw. I never learned, nunca aprendí a dibujar. No puedo pintar. No puedo esto. Pero this kind of arte, hombre, gives that person the ability to get a stencil and, you know, with pintura, spray or, you know, brush on or, you know, paint it on with a paintbrush, you know, todo. Se hace el arte. Uh, how did you come about, you know, getting this type of art, you know, and, and making it sort of like, you know, the premiere of your presentations? I mean, kind of, it has a lot of different uh, levels, but it's, it's like you were saying, you know, I'm not, I can't really draw as far as like when it comes, I can't do a painting, I can't paint freehand or any of that, but this is the way, if you're going to, it's all about accessibility, you know, that's something I learned from, from Shepard, you know, I, I was able to assist him for a couple of years and, and he was always about accessibility. We're going to be able to do the most we, uh, we can do with the abilities we have right now, you know, and I was always about, uh, and that's kind of the way I work, you know, and even... I mean, my dad started showing me how to cut stencils when I was a kid. My dad was a painter. He he, he painted uh, cars in my backyard, and, and uh, early on, he showed me how to cut stencils. And when I was 10, uh, my grandpa got me an X-Acto set. Around 11, I already had my airbrush, and, and it was always kind of, they always nurtured, like, my family always nurtured me as an artist, and, and uh, always pushed me for that kind of thing. But it was always, for me, I always chose the most accessible thing for me. You know? It's like the Cliff Notes version for me. <laughs> Pues mira, we're going to take another little short music break, and then we're going to come back here and uh, continue our conversation here with Ernesto, Irena, uh, some of the most uh, prerogative, radical arte coming out of Aslan. Orale. Gradually die, the whole planet starting to uprise. People of color starting to see through your white lies. Laughing on the mother of horse and hard lips. You don't think so? Look at your president. This whole nation's foundation was built on corruption. So the only solution is complete revolution. Like suicidal tiger squads in Sri Lanka. We got the float these international bank star. And this time you won't be able to hide in Switzerland. The president got here now, Greenspan. We got nothing to lose, but a whole lot to gain. Because America was the one that enslaved me. Like you labeled us hostile when we resist. Did you forget it was you that attacked us? Occupied the land. So now we're ready to bust We'll sit it up from the intellect to ease your land But your anti fighters will never give in Pudo Chica, no revolutionary front Bombing world trade centers and you will send for seas The revolution's on and the war won't cease Until we overthrow you, America Capulli put it down for the raza We declare war, you devils The basic big law of dictatorship On the west, my raza saw first for the battle My grandpa, Emiliano Zapata Was executed by the government in April 1919 that's right. Paz no mas. That's what we need to tell the reactionary government in this country. And we talk about government, huh, Gale. You know, uh, we can't trust government. Mm. You know, and that's the whole thing that goes amongst the indígena, the right. native peoples. You know, if you have issues and you want to know about the trust in government, just ask any Native American what they think about the government. You can't trust them. Orale. You're listening to 94.1 FM here with La Onda Bajitas, Radio del Barrio Slan. Yo soy Gavilar Molina. I'm here with my uh, engineer uh, at the board. Uh, 
Chief Engineer, uh, my compadre, Mr. Chuch, and we have our compañero Ernesto Llerena, who we've been talking to for the last almost half hour about the radical arte coming out and uh, emerging out of Aslan uh, to battle the ugly hatred and racism. Uh, you know, the people of Brown, the people of El Sol are, uh, you know, suffering right now and uh, enduring. Pues, uh, Ernesto, uh, as we, you know, uh, wrapping up this segment here of Aslan Rising, tell us a little bit about uh, the Ganas 2020, uh, your new work, and of course, you know, uh, it's going to be, I believe, on Larkin Street. Um, yeah, eight, 835 Larkin, right um, right at the intersection of Geary and Larkin. Andale. So it's going to be right there at White Walls Gallery. White Walls Gallery, that's right. And it's going to start uh, at, uh, from 7 to 11 p.m. tomorrow, mañana. And it runs to December the 4th. Yeah. Uh, there'll be a panel discussion tomorrow, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the panel discussion will be uh, myself, uh, Jesus Barraza, Melanie Cervantes from Dignidad Reverde in Oakland. And that's actually going to be earlier at 3 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, yeah. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Pues mira, Ernesto, any last uh, closing words you'd like to say? And, of course, I'd like, you know, for our radio, you know, listeners, la gente allá escuchando radio, to know uh, how they can contact you and how they can get more information or become involved. I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to get involved. One way would be going to altoarizona.com. You go, you go there. And you, if you're an artist, musician, you can donate your music or your arts. Um, go check it out, altoarizona.com. And my personal website is uh, echoconganas.com. So it's echoconganas.com. Um, I haven't updated it in a while, so <laughs> but um, you can check it out. You know, and there's a there's a way you can contact me there. Orale, pues again, uh, this is happening tomorrow at the White Walls uh, Galleries uh, in San Francisco. And uh, the Ganas 2020, the new works by Ernesto Yerena. Pues Ernesto, uh, it's been a pleasure, un placer. It's been uh, firme en uh, toda máquina, <laughs> you know, having you in the casa. Uh, what message do you want to send out there to the youth out there, the young people out there right now? Well, for me, the most important thing is knowledge. You know, learn about yourself, learn who you really are, and if, and that becomes your weapon. Knowledge becomes your weapon because if you know that, if you know who your your ancestors are, you know that you will never uh, give words like illegal any merit. You know, uh, illegal or immigrants or any of this stuff. It's not. Uh, it doesn't really. It's words that shouldn't even affect us because that's not who we are. If we really know who our true identity is, you know that we know that. Like the the, the so-called Mexicanos, we are indigenous people to the to the continent. You know? And uh, I mean, if you want to call yourself Mexicano, that's fine. I'm cool with that. You know, I, I don't mind. Some I I call myself Chicano, but if you want to call yourself even Hispanic, it's it's cool. With you just don't call me. That, yeah. <laughs> that's your panic. That's his panic. Her panic. Pues mira, Ernesto, gracias. Uh, you know, thanks for coming here to La Onda, being our guest here, and uh, it's your casa. Anytime you're up here in the area, Nortaka, you know, coming through, and we'd always uh, love to have you back and keep talking about the radical arte and uh, art and cultura as a force of political power. Pues gracias, carnal, and gracias tu compañeros. And uh, again, we uh, that was Ernesto Llerena, our guest here on Aslan Rising. Orale. And now we're going to take a music break before we come back with Terra Alerta. Yes, so keep it right here nomás, 94.1 KPFA, and we're here esta noche broadcasting from the mothership. Órale. <laughs> Por eso trae drogas y cuentes 
Todas estas casas para casa de padre, es socio, prostitución. La leona hace la fuerza, en el campo está la resistencia. Tenemos dos niños para ganar la guerra, ya no quiero más sangre. De mis cadáveres por la calle, como yo grande. Barrios únicos, a base de antecidos. Profetas perdidos en el mundo maligno, dones y vivo negro. Gritos, cuentazos, helicópteros, en el barrio donde está la solución. En la revolución, el diablo sí existe, y es el bicho el presidente. Quiere chingar con estos barrios y nuestra gente. Tenemos dos niños para ganar el poder, orgullo mexicano. Que viva el movimiento revolucionario, unidos a más de los vencidos. Why don't you free, Lena Peltier? Are all you in fear of the Western Hemisphere? Uprising against the neoliberalists, the IMF, and the Zionists. The white industry wants you in slavery. Got you chasing that currency. So you're quick to sell out for the money. So that you become property of the company. They killed and stole the land to build the society. Control the resources so the next step was industry. With your slavery, they finance the global economy. All controlled by the white Illuminati. You can't trust our natural born enemy. Just a Caucasian invasion. We all cut misery. So now you see, I'm not a racist at all. You just scared the unknown. You don't want to see Babylon fall. They haven't changed in over 500 years. 450 treaties broken, so you better hear how many more years it's gonna take before we learn that we gave them love. They gave us hate in return. Their roots are evil, so they're all devils. Sons and daughters of greed, jackals. Your wicked empire is coming to its end as it was. Ha! So shall it be again? Barrios unidos a más serán vencidos. 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 Do what I got to make it by when living lies that hurts no more. Gonna get ours conform. Urban native childs of sacred unity decolonizing go wild. Until I say nature, spirit to nature. Walk on is the womb to a life that is free. From sickness of the soul, the wicked and good give all respects to our equal and build our family and walk is in prayer lives a ceremony future thought to live on our children are the key earthquake martial law war then we be the people once again wickedness will win love for all the family peace to all my kin this world is mine truth is in belief in the life that i'm giving the choice that i'm living family man i'll forward for creation more my seed survival as a mother's Erasing wicked from a room, the some be chasing night skies, the spirits of the past seen in the eyes of our children, seven generation, nation, elders of the seeds that we Between now get be clearing. Between good and evil. We it we does not always try and rule. <laughs> Sometimes the dark side. Overcome, come, 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 come,
Thank you so much for inviting me to your show. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the work that FACES is involved in in the Philippines, particularly around Chevron and the environmental impacts um, both here and in the Philippines? Sure. So FACES, um, which again is the Filipino-American Coalition for Environmental Solidarity, um, we've been working since 2000 on um, transnational environmental justice issues. And so with our roots um, in the basis cleanup movement, um, since 2005, we've been working with communities based in Manila, um, kind of in the cosmopolitan heart of the Philippines, who are pushing uh, Chevron to, to both clean up and to relocate um, a toxic and hazardous oil depot that's been there, um, that's been impacting residents, um, and it has been linked with uh, chronic health impacts as well as environmental impacts. And how long has Chevron been in the Philippines? So Chevron has been in Manila for nearly a century. So it's, there is a, a long presence of having um, you know, U.S. corporations and U.S. oil corporations um, in the country. And can you tell us a little bit about sort of what it looks like and how it impacts the lives of the people every day? Sure. So one, one, um, one of the programs that FACES runs is called Face to Face, and this is kind of a solidarity delegation that brings U.S. residents um, to the Philippines to both um, learn about and engage with communities there um, who are pushing for environmental justice and to also just see from a very ground level um, what's happening. So what I can share is um, in 2005, which is the first time that I went to um, Manila and the community of Pandacan, um, had, I had the opportunity to speak with community members and to also see their day-to-day -day reality um, living on the, f the fence line of a Chevron Depot. And from there, I think one of the most striking things is just um, to see the lack of a buffer zone. And just explaining what that is, that would be to um, an area that's supposed to protect people from um, living in very close proximity to kind of industrial contamination. and. Over there um, in Manila, in Pandacan, um, these massive oil tanks are literally ringed by a park that Chevron and its oil company partners um, set up there as a supposed gift to the community. So as, as you're there, you can just see how um, both houses, schools, a university, churches, um, and businesses are literally living um, up to the side of um, a toxic oil depot. And what has SPACES been doing um, here in the Bay Area to support um, organizing in the Philippines to close down um, or remove these toxic areas? Since 2005, um, FACES' role has been to really amplify the concerns and the voices of communities in Manila. And so um, being based here in the Bay Area, we saw this as a strategic way of putting pressure on Chevron's headquarters, which are right in San Ramon, um, and so very close to where we are based. And so we've um, really pushed to try to open up um, dialogue with Chevron. Um, Chevron has not spoken directly with communities um, who are impacted by their operations in the Philippines. And so we've um, put pressure by, by uh, letter writing campaigns. Um, by pushing to have face-to-face um, -face meetings between Manila-based communities and with Chevron representatives. And we've also um, represented um, the concerns of our partners at um, various Chevron shareholders meetings so that we could bring the stories and the, the concerns of community members directly to um, Chevron management and Chevron shareholders. And um, has Chevron been at all responsive to any of your concerns? So one year ago, um, last September, um, several representatives from FACES, um, we had the opportunity to sit down directly with Chevron um, rep representatives at the world headquarters. Um, at the time, we, we really tried to bring our concerns, both as U.S. allies as well and um, as partners to Manila-based communities. Um, asking when would Chevron abide by um, the concerns of community members who were asking them to relocate, as well as the Supreme Court decision that ordered their closure um, several years ago. And at, you know, during our meeting, um, during our meeting, 
uh, Chevron representatives said that they would set up a meeting with um, Philippine-based community members. And as far as we know, that has not happened yet. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Supreme Court decision that ordered the closure of the site? Sure. I think what I'll just preface is that um, there's been a long legal battle between um, between the oil companies and with those who are um, really advocating for communities who are affected by its operations. Um, but in 2007, um, the Supreme Court ordered um, Chevron and its partners to shut down um, its oil depot in Manila, um, citing the risk to human health and human safety, as well as to the environment. And at the time, Chevron and its partners stalled out the order. And now several years later, we see that um, Chevron has refused to, to implement that order and still remains um, operating in Manila. We're talking with Eileen Suzara. She's the co-chair of FACES. They are a transnational group um, working here in the Bay Area and also working transnationally in the Philippines to hold corporations like Chevron accountable for the environmental justice and contamination that they cause. And I know that um, you're going to actually be celebrating um, faces and all the amazing work that you've done over the last decade. Can you tell me a little bit about what's planned for this weekend? Sure. Well, um, being based here in the Bay Area, we're really proud and excited to be able to connect with our community, um, share the stories from the Philippines, um, as well as here in the States about this um, transnational organizing work we've been doing for the past 10 years. And so um, on November 14th um, at the Bainihan Community Center in the, the Soma or South Market area, and we're going to be having a celebration called Cultivating a Legacy of Hope. And we really see that as... Um <laughs> so you're going to be celebrating this Sunday. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, who's going to be there, what time it starts, and what people can anticipate? So we are really eager to get people amped about the work that is going on um, to hold corporations accountable and really push for you know, a more just and healthy environment that all of us would want to live in. And so we're going to be hearing stories and testimonies from some FACES founding member and current members. Um, we're going to be featuring some really amazing local performers um, and musicians, including poet um, Amy Suzara, who goes spoken word and also addresses a number of environmental justice themes. Um, we're going to be hearing music from Diwa Kulintang Ensemble, and this is a uh, Bay Area-based women's Kulintang Ensemble um, who are going to be playing um, traditional gongs from the southern Philippines and also inviting people to join in movement and dance. Great, that sounds like an amazing event. And so that's your sister, that's a spoken word poet. Great. Um, well, let's take a moment and actually go to one of the performers and hear a little bit um, of her poetry and get a taste of what we might anticipate to hear this Sunday. letting us know about an amazing event coming up this Sunday. Um, it's going to be in San Francisco in the Somar. And what time does it start again? 2 p.m. on November 14th. And is it for families? How much does it cost? Can you tell us a little more? Sure. Um, the event is open to all. Um, it's a community event for all ages. Um, we are asking for donations um, for this event, um, starting at fifteen dollars and up. Um, and should get information. And for information on tickets, you can go to our website, which is www.facessolidarity.org, and that has information on how to RSVP and get a ticket, and to also see the full lineup of performers. 
And I know you've been involved in FACES for some years and now have a leadership role. And, um, you know, you've gone to the Philippines on these trips and actually testified at Chevron shareholders meetings. And as a young woman here in San Francisco, um, what really galvanized you um, and got you involved in this struggle? I would say that it's a love for community that really galvanized my involvement here um, with FACES. Um, as, a, as a young p I felt very empowered to be in a space um, that had both young and older folks involved and speaking out loud about the, the issues that we are concerned about. Um, I was really moved to be able to connect with my ancestral homeland in a more meaningful way beyond just vacations and trips back home, but to really um, gain a deeper understanding of how my life in the U.S. connects with that in the ancestral homeland. So I think there's a lot of that um, connection between heart and action that really keeps me involved with FACES and I, I think would, would be the same for many other folks. And for people out there who want to get involved, obviously they can come check out the event um, this weekend. But if they want to get involved on a deeper level, um, how can they get involved with FACES and other groups here in the Bay Area? Definitely. Well, we are certainly always looking for volunteers um, to assist with our research or with our um, education and awareness raising events. Um, so again, you can go to our website or, and contact us for more information on how to do that. Um, one thing that we encourage people to do is um, almost every summer we have, we have organized solidarity delegations to the Philippines um, called in a program called Face to Face. So we would encourage people to apply to that if that's something that they'd be interested in. And lastly, I really want to just emphasize that um, the issues around oil and environmental justice and climate justice affect all of us no matter where we are. Um, there's a lot of um, incredible work that's being done locally here by many community organizations. And I think one of the ways to deepen awareness and involvement with that um, could be to look at the coalition called the True Cost of Chevron Coalition. And that has a really groundbreaking report on um, Chevron's operations around the world and what communities are doing to oppose it. And that information is at um, www.truecostofchevron.com. Great. So we got www.truecostofchevron.com. And people can also check you out at the FACES website. Can you give that to us one more time? Sure. And the FACES website is www dot faces solidarity dot org okay, thank you so much Eileen any last words for our listeners thank you so much we hope to see you on November 14 and um, continue to build environmental justice from here to communities across the globe Great, right, thank you so much, and you are tuned in to the Tierra Alerta. I'm Tara, here with La Brava, and we'll be right back after this music break. Radio del Barrio Aslan, and I'd like to thank uh, Tara for her Terra Alerta report here on this segment. And uh, I got a barrio service announcement. Uh, a community celebration 
In solidarity with the Zapatista community, Simon que yes, a must. There's going to be a dinner, music, and speakers that Sunday, November the 14th, uh, from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Humanist Hall. That's 390 27th Street in Oakland, California. Keynote speaker, Laura Carlson on who, what's behind the drug war in Mexico. Uh, she's the director of the Mexico City-based America's Program of Center for International Policy. There's going to be in, uh, Son Arrocho Musica by Son del Valle. Also uh, Comida, uh, Cena Mexicana, Authentic Mexican Dinner. And uh, there'll be admission at the door. Uh, sponsored by the Chiapas Support Committee. Uh, for more information, you can call 510-654-9583, excuse me, 9587. That's 510-654-9587. And, uh, or you can go to www.chiapas-support.org. Again, a community celebration in solidarity with the Zapatistas community, dinner, music, and speakers, Sunday, November the 14th, from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Humanist Hall at 390 27th Street in Oaktown in Oakland, California. Orale, and Pedro, uh, you got something coming up here? Yes, that's right, Mr. Gavilan. We got uh, Scott Yunt, who's going to be talking to us about Lawrence Livermore National Lab- Laboratory out there and uh, telling us the importance of being aware of what's going on in these uh, facilities and uh, you know because as we know nuclear development is uh, is a big huge uh, process going on in the political world you know that uh, really defines what nuclear activity is but then when it comes down to you know the laboratories uh, messing up and not uh, reporting that to the news or you know security or whatever purposes right uh letting things slide by and the media not even paying attention to it, it although it could create something uh like chaos for the community right so we have scott who's here uh who's going to tell us a little bit more about what's going on at lawrence livermore national laboratory because i heard recently uh an article came out by the trivalleycare.org that saying that they got a fine for some reason so we're going to find out more about that scott how, how you doing today that's right, Pedro. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the air. We're right on. So tell us a little bit about what you guys found out over there at Tri-Valley Cares. Uh, you know, there's a lot of news that doesn't make it to the mainstream media, so hopefully this will uh, get some of the attention that, you know, this type of information needs, right? There, there sure is, and uh, that's very true. I, so I work out at Tri-Valley Communities Against a Radioactive Environment. or a nonprofit community group that's out in Livermore, California, and it's just 50 miles east of San Francisco. And in the city of Livermore, there is a laboratory, the National Lab, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and it is a nuclear weapons research and development laboratory that's run by the Department of Energy. So just recently, um, they were fined by the Department of Energy at Livermore Lab because, um, you know, they have a whole bunch of radioactive and toxic material on site that they use to do development of nuclear weapons and research. And they have uh, been violating some of the worker safety laws. Um, as re- in respect to a specific toxic metal called beryllium. So basically, they've been allowing workers to get exposed to beryllium there um, because they've been allowing violations of the safety standards. And so they were fined uh, $200,000 by the Department of Energy just recently. Um, and they really should have been fined more because this fine was based on uh, just four exposures in the uh, recent few years, but uh, just fi- just in 2007, there was an exposure to over 178 contract workers who were doing construction work on an HVAC system in a building, and, and it was found that they were exposed to beryllium dust, and uh, that part isn't isn't even included in the fine. So there's all sorts of news stories about work exposures there out in Livermore that don't get reported. 
So what are some of the effects? Can you give us like an example of what somebody might have uh, gotten if they were exposed to this? Oh, sure. So beryllium is some you know, dust when inhaled. It causes uh, something called beryllium sensitivity, which then leads to chronic beryllium disease, which is actually a fatal lung disease, and it's a very painful way to die. Uh, it's also linked to lung cancer. It frequently causes lung cancer. And uh, when workers are exposed to this, you know, it's actually hard to detect, and it, it is something that takes time and uh, in realization of this there's been a federal program created called the Energy Employee Occupational Illness Compensation Program that's created to uh, give them health care and it's uh, something that's you know, referred to by the Department of Energy as a way in which they've uh, attempted to take care of the workers and the legacy that this contamination has caused among workers, of which there's thousands. In fact, in Livermore alone, there's been 3,000 workers who have applied for benefits under this act. Unfortunately, not very many of them end up getting benefits. In fact, it's around one quarter who end up getting benefits. It's a very bureaucratic process that forces these sick workers to try to prove that they were exposed to radiation at a level that made it more likely than not than that their disease was caused by their exposure. A very high standard, a very hard thing for sick people to have to deal with and to prove when oftentimes it's cut and dry that these people are sick because of their exposures to these illnesses. That's right. And they end up dying without getting any uh, benefits. It's, it's a very sad situation and these people live in our community out in Livermore. Where, where, they, and so you know, it sounds like the whole uh, Le Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is being run by the Department of Energy, but in reality, there's also other uh, I identities that are also involved in running these types of labs. Which I know for one is the UC system. That's true. The University of California managed the Lawrence Livermore Lab and, and Los Alamos National Lab, which is in New Mexico. The two of those labs are um, the kind of brain of the nuclear weapons complex in the United States. Um, and the University of California exclusively managed them until 2007. So every nuclear weapon in our arsenal in the United States was developed by a University of California employee, which gives us a certain um, voice in this debate <laughs> about nuclear weapons and yeah. their viability in our in our world and whether or not we should have them, which I would say we definitely should not have them. Exactly. Um, but as Californians, we can really speak up about this. But recently, in 2007, the contract was actually changed because of um, problems in security. And so the, in 2007, they put the contract up for bid. And guess who bid? Well, a bunch of private corporations like Bechtel Corporation and Butthell Corporation and Lockheed Martin right, ended Scott. up joining with University of California, and now they manage it together. Thank you for that information. If more folks want to get more information, can you give them a contact information where they can Please, get information yeah, quickly? Yes, check out our website at www.trivalleycares.org, and uh, you'll get all the information you want, and that's got our contact info on there. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Scott Young from trivalleycares.org. Thanks, Pedro. Good night. Good night. No more nuclear weapons, Capilán. We can't be spending more money on nuclear weapons. No more, Miguel. No more money on nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, we need food, not bombs. Right. We need books, not bombs. Mm -hmm. You know, we need immigration reform, not bombs. Mm, right. Orale. And uh, it's top of the hour? Almost. It's um, 8.58, Miguel. Maybe you got a couple words you want to uh, let Just the real quickly, know. Uh, right now, La Peña. Uh, is on its 8th annual Echo in Califas Festival. It runs all the way through November the 14th. That means it runs through Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, ni de aquí, ni de allá. And uh, again, it's uh, a lot of art artists, hip-hop, music, entertainment, poets, all of it coming at you uh, at La Peña Cultural Center. That's 3105 Shattuck Avenue. Uh, for more information, you can go to uh, www.lapeña.org or call 510-849-2568.
You are invited to a film screening, Shadow Play, a documentary about Burma's political prisoners, on Friday, November 19th from 7 to 10 p.m. in Berkeley. Nobel Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi is the most well-known of Burma's over 2,000 political prisoners. The filmmaker, Jean Hallisey, will be present to discuss the film. Admission is $15 on a sliding scale and includes dinner and will benefit the film project and the Burma Education Fund. Friday, November 19th at Berkeley Fellowship Unitarian Universalist Hall, 1924 Cedar Street at Benita in Berkeley. For more information, please call Greg, 415-867-0377. of the hour 859 with 58 seconds and you are listening to 94.1 FM Berkeley 89.3 KPFB Berkeley 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org and now I'm going to turn it over to El Gavilan Orale, gracias compadre yo soy El Gavilan Molina coming at you here on La Onda Bajitas, Radio del Barrio Aslan. And I'd like to thank uh, Pedro Reyes and, of course, uh, the camarada, the homie Scott, for giving us an update here on the nuclear madness. Eso. Uh, there's going to be an evening with Nobel Peace Prize winner Rigoberta Menchu, Empowering La Raza, part of the Empowering La Raza series, coming out of Homies Empowerment Program from the YMCA under the direction of Cesar Cruz, longtime activist and homeboy, Acá with La Onda. This is happening Monday, November the 15th at 6.30 p.m. And we're going to be bringing you more information uh, on that event. Uh, but for right now, we're going to take a, a, a minute break here. And then we're going to come but we hit you with uh, Radio Venceremos al Norte, uh, featuring uh, our own Miguel Perez uh, as the host, and Julio Leva bringing you the información aquí. Bienvenidos, compañeros. Muy buenas noches. Aquí estamos en Radio Venceremos al Norte. Les habla Miguel Pérez y hoy estamos en compañía de Salvador Cordón. Muy buenas noches, Salvador, ¿cómo te encuentras? Muy bien, muy buenas noches, Miguel, y agradeciendo a la KPFA por darnos este espacio y esta oportunidad. Muy bien, vamos a comenzar nuestro programa eh, con algunos temas eh, que son nuevos, vigentes, eh, que son nuevos, vigentes que de todas maneras eh, me imagino que son temas que han estado dentro de la agenda política del FMLN, como por ejemplo eh, lo de las elecciones en el exterior. Ha habido diferentes países que lo han implementado tratando de crear algún nivel de representación en las asambleas, ya sea tanto senados como diputados. Eh, Ustedes en estos momentos están planteando de que haya elecciones en el exterior. Sí, desde, desde antes de las elecciones pasadas eh, ya había un acuerdo en El Salvador de hacer e implementar lo más pronto posible un sistema de voto para que los salvadoreños que vivimos en el exterior pudiéramos participar en las elecciones. Eh, por falta de voluntad política de la derecha, esto no se ha podido implementar. Eh, ahora que el FMLN esté en el gobierno, esperamos que se logre hacerlo. Eh, la idea ahorita, el FMLN acaba de presentar una propuesta para que se comience a partir de las elecciones del próximo 2012, que son para diputados y miembros de la Asamblea Legislativa. Eh, la forma que el FMLN propone para evitar todos los obstáculos que la derecha pone para implementar una votación masiva es de que los salvadoreños en el exterior votemos por correspondencia. Y esta elección, eh, ¿qué cargos eh, conllevaría? ¿Algún nivel de representatividad por parte de las necesidades de los salvadoreños del exterior? ¿O sería directamente sobre los cargos que están este, en elección en El Salvador? Y ese es probablemente el problema más grande que hay en la implementación de esto. Eh, definitivamente que los salvadoreños en El Salvador podemos votar para candidatos a presidente. Eh, porque todo el mundo vota por los mismos candidatos. El problema se complejiza cuando estamos hablando de alcaldes y de diputados. 
porque está la constitución y la regulación de la del de Salvador eh, no, no 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 establece ningunos parámetros para para ver de por qué diputados vamos a votar los salvadoreños en el exterior por qué alcaldes entonces se está hablando ahorita de una votación eh, solamente para presidente o sea no se armaría un distrito distinto no los inmigrantes no tendrían un representante en la asamblea eso es una es una alterna, es una opción que hay eh, el FMLN es la, es la opción que propone de que se cree un, 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 una, un curul en la asamblea eh, o más si es necesario para representar a los tres millones y medio de salvadoreños que vivimos en el exterior y dentro de este tema que las elecciones en el exterior tiene que ver con estos tres millones de salvadoreños que se encuentran afuera eh, también entiendo de que hay una propuesta de ley de asistencia al migrante ¿qué comprende eso? ¿qué, qué comprende esta ley? ¿a qué sectores comprende? Eh, la ley de asistencia y protección al migrante y su familia es una propuesta de ley que el FMLN presentó en la Asamblea Legislativa hace cuatro años. Eh, claro, la derecha la engavetó. Esta es una, es una ley muy integral y muy comprensiva, que basada en el principio constitucional de que el Estado salvadoreño tiene que... Eh, Defende, velar por los intereses de los salvadoreños donde quiera que estén y cualquiera que sea su situación, eh, eh, demanda al Estado primero la creación de una institución que sería el Consejo Nacional de Atención al Migrante, que sería una, una institución autónoma eh, formada con representativos del gobierno en turno, eh, de los salvadoreños viviendo en el exterior y de agencias de servicios que brindan servicios a los, a los migrantes. Eh, esto tendría su propio presupuesto y sería independiente y autónoma. Y tendría también jurisdicción para proponer legislaturas, para proponer leyes que protejan al, al migrante. Eh, eh, la protección y la asistencia se ve como una cuestión bastante integral, porque la idea es proteger tanto al, 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 al inmigrante que ya está ubicado en el país de, de destino, como a los familiares que han quedado en El Salvador. De, ese, de esos inmigrantes. También protege a los migrantes en su ruta de tránsito eh, hacia el país de destino. En este caso, el, el, el más mayoritario es el, hacia los Estados Unidos, en su tránsito por Guatemala y por México. Eh, la idea es eh, crear ventanillas especializadas en los consulados para brindar asistencia y ayuda en, en problemas de urgencia. Eh, este, esto de alguna forma mmm, tiene que ver con relaciones... Eh, en la región, en la región centroamericana y también con respecto a Estados Unidos. ¿Ha habido conversaciones en cuanto a esto con el gobierno de Guatemala, con el gobierno de México, con el gobierno de Estados Unidos? Sí, de hecho, y, y, y desafortunadamente, eh, como respuesta a la masacre de Tamaulipas hace algunos meses, eh, eh, los gobiernos, el resto de gobiernos de Centroamérica se alarmaron ante la situación. Y ahora, por ejemplo, en, en México existen eh, consulados mixtos, eh, de El Salvador y Guatemala, en algunos casos de Honduras, eh, que se han unido los cónsules para brindar asistencia a los, a los que van en tránsito allí. Esto es el principio nada más. Pero básicamente nosotros estamos hablando de, de la, la obligación del Estado salvadoreño a atender eh, a sus connacionales. En este caso no, no estamos hablando de hacer, de coordinar cuestiones, claro, pero sería una, una acción independiente de, de la, del Estado salvadoreño. Eh... ¿Qué se requiere para que esto ocurra? Para ahorita, a nivel de, de inmediato, lo que se requiere es poner presión a la Asamblea para que se apruebe esta ley lo más pronto posible. Como te expliqué antes, la ley fue presentada hace cuatro años. Eh, ha sido consistentemente eh, engavetada por la derecha. Eh, que era mayoritaria en otras legislaciones, en esta donde el FMLN está más fuerte, hemos logrado un acuerdo político con la mayoría del resto de partidos de mover esta ley lo más pronto posible. Ahorita, a partir de la semana pasada, eh, se comenzaron a hacer las discusiones sobre la ley en la, en la Comisión de Relaciones Exteriores de la Asamblea Legislativa de El Salvador. Eh, pero también la derecha está maniobrando para... Eh, eh, 
hacer más lento el proceso o probablemente para impedir que la ley pase. Por ejemplo, en, eh, eh, han sido muy pocas las sesiones que se han llevado a cabo para discutir esa ley a partir desde la semana pasada que fue cuando se inició supuesta, oficialmente la discusión. Eh, el partido Arena no llega a las reuniones y a veces convence a otros eh, representantes de partidos de derecha para que no lleguen, entonces la reunión se tiene que suspender porque no hay quórum. Esto es una, una, una maniobra muy consistente de parte de la, de la derecha. Nosotros... ¿Y cuál es el interés que tiene la derecha en que esto no ocurra? Probablemente eh, eh, es de que ellos necesitan una, que la migración siga. Eh, hay, hay, eh, hay intereses económicos muy grandes detrás del, de, 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 del proceso migratorio. Eh, eh, así lo, lo mismo se está viendo eh, con, la, con la otra propuesta de ley que, que metió el FMLN, que es para reducir los precios de las medicinas en El Salvador eh, y también para eh, aumentar la... la la cobertura, poder comprar más medicinas para, para que la gente necesita. Es, es una lucha cuesta arriba en contra de los intereses más grandes a nivel de las transnacionales mundiales. Porque estamos hablando, el FMI lo que propone es una regulación de precios. Y claro, regular, regular precios es el anatema, es el pecado más grave que se puede com cometer a grande, en contra de las transnacionales. Efectivamente. El Salvador, y el, recordarnos eh, dentro del Producto Bruto Interno del de Salvador... Eh, el porcentaje de dinero que aporta los migrantes salvadoreños al país. Entiendo que las remesas constituyen eh, algo así como el 17% del, de la producción interna bruta de El Salvador. Eh, eh, es la fuente más grande de, de ingreso de, de divisas en El Salvador. Está por arriba de la, de, 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 del dinero que entra por la exportación de café, que es el rubro agrícola más grande. Y esto atado a los mecanismos de llegada del dinero, donde hay agencias, donde hay bancos, donde el dólar no siempre se paga de la mejor manera a la gente. Uh -huh. Con relación a tu comentario, quería eh, eh, hablar algo que está un poco tangente, pero es que, que es muy interesante con respecto a lo de las remesas, porque nos trae otro problema muy grande también en El, en el Salvador y en la región. El FMLN hizo un estudio... En el, del año 2003 sobre las remesas se estableció basado en cifras tomadas de fuentes oficiales de fuentes del gobierno tales como el Banco Central de Reserva la Dirección Nacional de Estadística y Censo de que ese año habían entrado al Salvador la cantidad de dos billones y medio de dólares en, en, en calidad de remesas luego se profundizó el estudio y también con cifras sacadas de los organismos oficiales eh, se llegó a, las, a, a, a cumplir de que los salvadoreños que vivimos en el exterior, la cantidad que habíamos mandado como remesas en ese año, en 2003, había sido nada más 900, 900 millones de dólares, un poco más de 900 millones de dólares, o sea, cerca de un billón de dólares. Pero al, al país entraron dos billones y medio. Eso nos presentó con la gran incógnita, ¿de dónde sale el billón y medio? Eh, y... ¿Y este dinero va a como dinero de inversión? ¿Va como dinero a instituciones? ¿Va como dinero el estudio? ¿Podía más o menos poder rastrear? Lo, 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 el, el indicio que da eso, eh, eh, y, y yo cre creo que no es una afirmación audaz, sino que basada en, 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 en los indicios que hay, es de que esa gran cantidad de dinero es producto de lavado de dinero. Es el dinero que de las ventas de droga aquí en los Estados Unidos eh, que entra a El Salvador para ser lavado. Eh, pues eso explica también de que eh, en ese año antes de que los bancos salvadoreños fueran vendidos a los grandes eh, bancos transnacionales, eh, teníamos cerca de 39 sucursales de bancos salvadoreños distribuidas en todo el Caribe cuando en el Caribe no hay poblaciones grandes de salvadoreños. Eh, eh, también te daba el indicio de que esa es toda una cañería para el lavado de dinero. O sea, estamos hablando de, de, de que más de la, dos terceras partes de las remesas que aparentemente entran a El Salvador no son de realidad remesas, son producto del de lavado de dinero. Ahora imaginémonos cuánto entrará en México, que estamos hablando de 40 billones de dólares anuales en, en remesas. Wow. Salvador, y 
dentro de este, de este marco, ya que lo tocaste el tema sobre el lavado de dinero, eh, ¿cuál es la situación del narcotráfico en El Salvador en estos momentos? Pues la última teoría que ha salido allá es, es de que como resultado de la supuesta guerra eh, en contra del narcotráfico en México, que está muy candente, por cierto, eh, definitivamente se le, hace, le, le hace la situación más difícil al narcotráfico. Entonces ellos están buscando otros teatros de operaciones. Eh, el país que, en el cual ellos se han estado operando también como apoyo a sus operaciones en México ha sido tradicionalmente Guatemala. Entonces se espera y parece que ya se está dando, ya, ya está sucediendo, de que, eh, por ejemplo, o sea, hay... hay Indicios en El Salvador por capturas que se han hecho de que los Zetas ya han comenzado a operar en El Salvador. Eh, y ese, entonces se espera que, que lleguen esas otras bandas. Pero eso solamente es una, una, una de las expresiones del narcotráfico. Desde hace muchos años tenemos eh, la actividad de lavado de dinero en El Salvador. Eh, es inexplicable cómo en un país tan pobre como en El Salvador... Eh, eh, se encuentran no no no, en la, no solo en la capital sino que en varias ciudades agencias de, de carros que venden carros Porsche y Ferrari eh, en ese país <ríe> una propuesta del FMLN para el combate contra el narcotráfico bueno ese es un problema muy complejo porque este definitivamente no es un problema que se va a resolver desde un solo país tiene que ser una, un, una acción coordinada eh, eh, de todos los gobiernos de la, re, de la región, eh, tocándole la mayor responsabilidad a los Estados Unidos, que es el país más consumidor de droga, es donde se origina el, el problema. Eh, el, la doctrina que el FMLN está presionando por implantar eh, en El Salvador con respecto a esto, es primero eh, consolidar los mecanismos del país para evitar la entrada del lavado de dinero y también para... Eh, eh, controlar las, el enriquecimiento ilícito, o sea, tener, te, tener sistemas que nos avisen cuando una persona eh, está, está teniendo ingresos fuera de lo normal o desproporcionados a, a sus ingresos reales. Eh, es una combinación de, de represión más incentivo para la inversión legal que tiene que haber allá también. ¿Y cómo es el ambiente político en El Salvador en cuanto a esto? Es decir, ¿qué, qué, qué es el... La... Hay, me imagino que, por ejemplo, debería haber una reforma sobre impuestos. Me imagino que debería haber una voluntad política, precisamente de todos los sectores políticos, para poder acordar leyes frente a esto. Sí, eh, tenemos un problema fiscal muy, muy, muy profundo en El Salvador. Eh, hay una urgente eh, necesidad de mejorar el, el, el sistema fiscal del país. Eh, hace... Más o menos un año eh, se oía, aún hasta los diarios de, de derecha estaban, los periódicos de derecha estaban de acuerdo en, en, en que, en, 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 en que la, todo el mundo tenía que contribuir a sacar al país de la crisis. Pero ahora que se están viendo algunos movimientos del gobierno con respecto a eh, eh, mejorar los sistemas de, de recolección de impuestos, a, a imponer algunos impuestos necesarios eh, de una manera justa, de, de, en el sentido de que el que gane más, pague más y no recargarle como ahora a la gente más pobre eh, eh, la gran cantidad de impuestos, la, la, la mayor proporción de impuestos. Eh, en la práctica no está sucediendo. Hay un gran rechazo. Ahorita hay una gran campaña mediática en contra de las propuestas del gobierno de Funes y del FMLN eh, para, para mejorar el sistema financiero. Eh, nada más, hace, hace como un mes, eh, la derecha parlamentaria eh, pasó una regulación eh, cancelando el, el, la obligación que había a las personas para declarar su patrimonio. Ellos pasaron una regulación en la cual todo aquel que gana más de 75 mil dólares al año ya no tiene que declarar su patrimonio. Wow. Wow. Salvador, hablando de cosas que tienen que ver con la vida interna de los partidos políticos, eh, entiendo de que se, estaba, que se hizo la 26 convención del Partido Frente para uno Partido para la Liberación Nacional. Eh, ¿Nos puedes contar un poco sobre esto? Sí, el pasado eh, 31 de octubre eh, se dio la 26, la vigésimo sexta eh, convención extraordinaria del FMLN. Eh, el, el objetivo único de esta convención eh, fue la elección de las nuevas autoridades internas del partido. 
eh, la participación, eh, el part la, la, la Convención Nacional de Partidos es el máximo organismo dentro del FMLN. Está compuesto por eh, convencionistas que representan los diversos sectores y niveles del, del partido. Hay cerca de 540 convencionistas. Eh, la convención se inauguró en el primer llamada de quórum con alrededor de 490 de estos. O sea que tuvimos una asistencia excelente y se logró en esas... Eh, en esa convención, elegir por voto secreto eh, al nuevo Consejo Nacional, que después de la convención es el siguiente eh, organismo en, a nivel jerárquico, eh, y también eh, esta eligió a la nueva Comisión Política, que es el mayor organismo ejecutivo del, del partido. Además de esto, del, del, convención, de, del Consejo Nacional, se eligieron los comités del de Tribunal de Ética, y el Tribunal de Contraloría, que es un, es un ente creado en el partido para controlar eh, la honestidad eh, de los funcionarios del FMLN. Salvador, cuéntanos un poquito de la vida interna del Frente en cuanto a nivel de decisiones o propuestas que provienen desde las bases. ¿Cómo funciona eso? Bueno, el, el, el Frente básicamente es una un partido de masas eh, eh, su organización principal son los comités de base eh, hay comités de base del FMLN en todos y cada uno de los municipios y cantones del país estos son los organismos principales porque son el vínculo del partido con, con las bases sociales y también son los que nutren al partido con eh, las necesidades e intereses de esas eh, bases sociales eh, a nivel estructural eh, el partido tiene los comités eh, de base a su nivel más, más, más básico. Eh, luego está la Comisión Política del Partido, que es el, el organismo ejecutivo permanente que maneja el partido en la vida diaria, eh, que tiene algunas ramificaciones. Tiene secretarías como la Secretaría de Cultura, Secretaría de Finanzas, Secretaría de Educación Política, etc. Eh, entonces es un partido con una estructura bastante simple, pero muy pegada a las, a las masas. Muy bien, Salvador, eh, ¿alguna cosa que nos quieras comentar en cuanto a las cosas que están sucediendo en El Salvador en estos días? Bueno, en cuanto a lo que nos incumbe a nosotros ahorita, la urgencia está en recoger firmas de salvadoreños para poner presión en la derecha legislativa para que se apruebe la ley de, de asistencia al migrante y su familia. Es una ley muy necesaria, es una ley... este eh, muy justa que, que viene a, a, a solucionar un problema muy grave que, que hay que solucionar eh, y no podemos permitir que la derecha lo haga. Nuestros comités de base en todo el área de la bahía se encuentran en esa tarea ahorita. Este, ustedes van a encontrar compañeros nuestros en las estaciones del BART, eh, en, en las entradas de los bancos, eh, que les estarán pidiendo la firma. Eh, también... este eh, Pueden acercarse a los compañeros de los comités de base para que ayudarnos con, con esta firma. Para ayudarnos en esta campaña no, tiene, no se tiene que hacer salvadoreño. Cualquier persona puede tomar una cartita y ayudarnos a sacar la firma. La firma sí tiene que ser de salvadoreños, pero necesitamos una... Eh, Salvador, ¿algún teléfono, alguna página web donde la gente se pueda comunicar en cuanto a esta tarea? Sí, la, pueden buscar la, la página del FMLN... Norcal, eh, punto org eh, y, y, y ahí encontrarán toda, toda esta información. ¿Y algún teléfono tienes por ahí? El teléfono, les voy a dar el teléfono de mi oficina porque la verdad es que no tenemos un teléfono operativo. Es el 415-753-7723. Muy bien, Salvador Condón, se nos va agotando el tiempo inexorablemente. Muchísimas gracias por habernos traído estas novedades el día de hoy y bueno, nos volveremos a encontrar dentro de poco. Bueno, muchas gracias Miguel y buenas noches a todos. Muy buenas noches. Esto fue Radio Venceremos al Norte con Miguel Pérez y Salvador Cordón el día de hoy. Muchas gracias.
Feliz celebration in solidarity with the Zapatistas communities. That's right. Sunday, November the 14th from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Humanist Hall at 390 27th Street in Oakland, Oakland, California. Again, a community celebration with the Zapatistas communities in Chiapas. Dinner, musica, and speaker. This is going to happen at the Humanist Hall at uh, Oakland off of 27th Street, 390 27th Street. Keynote speaker Laura Carlson on what's behind the drug war in Mexico. She's the director of the Mexico City-based America's Program of Center for International Policy. Lots of son, arrocho musica, uh, authentic Mexican comida dinner, and sponsored by the Chiapas Support Committee. Get your tickets now. For more information, 510-654-9587. That's 510-654-9587. Or you can go to www.chiapas-support.org. Orale. Sunday, November 14th. Zapatistas Community at the Humanist Hall, 5 to 9 p.m. And the musica here that uh, my compadre is playing is uh, what's the 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 uh, the rolita there? It's from La Mission. That's right, the Mission songs from La Mission. That's the soundtrack that came out of the mo- uh, the movie featuring uh, Benjamin Pratt and the cast of Mission Homies. Uh, the song Son de la Mission. Orale, songs from the Mission. Orale, right here, no más. And uh, we'll be playing their musica uh, for the remainder of the program and for the remainder of the year and for years to come. Eso. Keep it right here nomás. You're listening to Los Bajitas, Radio del Barrio Aslan. We're going to finish off this rolita. And then we got a special cruising with the Combs coming up with myself, Mr. Chooch, and Joss Elwood. Orale. Radio del Barrio Aslan, and now we're getting ready here. It's uh, 9.30, a uh, half-hour countdown to 10, and uh, get ready now to be cruising with the comps, with El Gavilan, Mr. Chooch, my compadre, and Joss here, who's going to be bringing you the lineup of music. That's right, we are the comps, and we're cruising with you. We're going to bring those firme rolitas, you know, the blast from the past. Get ready here, because I know Joss has quite a lineup for us tonight. Orale.
This is Josh Elwood on La Onda Bahita. That was Jackie Wilson. We got Shaboom coming up next. If I could take you up in paradise up above Shaboom. If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love Life would be a dream Sweetheart, hello, hello again Shaboom, and oh, boom, we'll meet again, boom Then on the ding, on the lang, the lang, the lang Oh, 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 oh,
That was a platters with only you. Right, with rock around the clock. Right, and you can rock around the clock, and then finally you can knock on wood. Josh on La Onda. Keep on supporting KPFA. And I'd love to hear from more people. It's been real fun, Chooch, Miguel. I'm going to get out. Josh is out of here.
we're going to slow it down a little bit with some tears on my pillow. <laughs> Okay. 
you out there to chooch. Happy birthday. Of course he's my son. Come on.
just cruising, huh? And uh, songs from La Mision, Orale, that was Be Thankful. And we got a lot to be thankful here. Tonight we uh, hear La Onda. We're sending out a special cubo out there uh, to La Brava, who's uh, taken a couple of uh, weeks off here. And uh, thanking her for all her work here at La Onda. She will be back here shortly. And also tonight, uh, La Onda Bajita sending out our prayers uh, to John Triple, a homeboy camarada up there from the North Bay. Uh, prayers to you, John, for your full recovery. And a special cue out there to Argelio, Giron, and all the gente out there in Bos Mechista. A special cue out there to Bongo and Deva. Ojadle from uh, the homies here cruising with La Onda. To La Smiling Blue Eyes from the one and only. And uh, a special cue to La Gata de la O. Orale, aquí vamos. The Solita is going out to you next. Quickly, we have uh, just a uh, announcement here. Homies Empowerment Program presents an evening with Nobel Peace Prize winner Rigoberta Menchu. That's right. Uh, that's going to be happening Monday, November the 15th at 6.30 p.m. in Oaktown in Oklon. And uh, you can get more information uh, for this uh, by going to Cruz uh, at... Uh, ymcaeastbay.org again that's c cruz at uh, ymcaeastbay.org or you can call 510-776-3740 that's 510-776-3740 for more information this is happening again monday november the 15th at 6 30 p.m and uh a program brought to you by Homies Empowerment Program out of the YMCA with our carnal homeboy, Cesar Cruz. Orale. And don't forget, a community celebration in solidarity with the Zapatistas community. Sunday, November 14th from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Humanist Hall, 390 27th Street in Oakland. Again, you can get more information at 510-654-9587 or you can go to www.chiapas-support.org. Orale. And now we're getting ready here to turn it over to the history of funk. I'd like to thank uh, uh, all our guests esta noche aquí. Uh, Ernesto Yaran that came in with his arte and he's going to be doing his thing at the White uh, Walls uh, Gallery in San Francisco mañana. Check that out. And don't forget the uh, Regaberta Menchu Monday, November the 15th at 6.30 p.m. And uh, uh, also uh, coming up uh, next uh, week is Jorge Santana who's going to be at the uh, downtown Napa Uptown Theater, Saturday, November 20th, in the evening at 8 o'clock show. Uh, we'll be giving some ticket giveaways next Friday, so remember Jorge Santana and Mago, Saturday, November 20th, at the Uptown Theater in downtown Napa, 1350 3rd Street. That's happening next Saturday, November the 20th. Stay tuned next week when we come back for some ticket giveaways. And uh, again, I'd like to thank my crew here, Tara, Pedro Reyes, Mr. Chuch, everybody involved in tonight's production, Tocayo Perez, along with the compañero Salvador, and everybody that helped put this show together, Pedro Navarro, and uh, everybody that put the hard work. Esta noche, it's almost top of the hour here. We're going to turn it over to Ricky Vincent and the history of fun coming up here. And acuérdense que el derecho al respeto ajeno hace la paz. Órale. Yeah. 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 